Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Emily Su. And I'm Edna Day. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Hong Kong and Philippine government settle Manila bus hostage dispute, but there's still no real apology. Survivors and victims' families agree to compensation package, saying it's time to move on. U.S. President begins Asian tour on controversial note by taking Japan's side against China. More than three years after the Manila bus hostage tragedy, Hong Kong and the Philippines have settled the dispute over an apology and compensation for the victims and their families. A visiting delegation from Manila today expressed the Philippine government's most sorrowful regret and offered about $20 million in compensation to survivors and victims' families. But it looks like both sides choose a face-saving way out, as the Philippine government is still not using the word sorry or apology, and no officials responsible have have really been punished. With the administration maintaining a total information blackout since yesterday, everyone could only speculate about the comings and goings of vehicles at government headquarters this morning. Manila Mayor Joseph Estrada's city-level delegation was joined by Philippine President Benigno Aquino's right-hand man, Cabinet Secretary Jose Almendras, when they met Chief Executive Leung Chin Ying today. That set the stage for a resolution of the long-running dispute between the SAR and the Philippines over the Manila hostage tragedy of August 2010. Eight Hong Kong residents were killed when a sacked Filipino policeman took them hostage on their tour bus, and the siege ended in a bloodbath after a bungled rescue attempt by Manila police. Since then, Hong Kong has been pushing four demands, a formal government apology, compensation for the victims, punishment for those responsible, and safety guarantees for tourists. The chief executive finally broke the silence late this afternoon, announcing that the two sides had settled on the deal. It has been over three years since the Manila hostage-taking incident. Yet, the sufferings of the victims and the families remain close to our hearts. With a final resolution of the incident, I sincerely hope that the deceased may rest in peace and the injured and the families can move on with courage and strength. As far as the apology is concerned, in the joint statement agreed on by the two sides, the Philippine government expresses its most sorrowful regret and profound sympathy and extends its most sincere condolences for the pain and suffering of the victims and their families. It's still short of a direct and simple sorry, and similar to expressions of regret made in the past by the Philippine president, who has repeatedly refused to apologize on the grounds that his country is not to blame for the actions of one man. But the chief executive said it was good enough, citing an apology letter from the Philippine National Police Chief to the survivors and victims' families. The Hong Kong side, um, and I would uh, go as far as saying that uh, include uh, myself, my colleagues, and also the victims and the families in the process uh, do believe that the Philippine side has been sincere in discussing with um, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and the sincerity has led to the agreement uh, between the victims and the families and the Philippines uh, government on this matter. It's understood that the Philippines is offering about $20 million in compensation, but there's no official confirmation. It's been reported that the families of those who died will get $3 million each, those who are severely injured will receive $1.5 million, and half a million dollars each will go to the other survivors. The Philippine delegation has also provided an update of action taken against officials responsible for the bungled rescue attempt. Former Manila Police Chief Rodolfo Majid Bey has since retired, but he was demoted last October, and this affects his retirement benefits, which are currently being withheld until his case is fully resolved. Superintendent Orlando Yebra, who was the chief negotiator, was also demoted last year, but he's appealing the decision. Two other officers were also found to be negligent, but no one is facing criminal charges or being forced to resign. Among those who escaped punishment is a key official, Alfredo Lim, who was Manila's mayor at the time and criticized for having dinner when the crisis played out. As for tourist safety, more than 2,800 police officers have been trained under a program launched following the tragedy to create special teams to protect tourists. In return, Hong Kong is lifting its sanctions against the Philippines. The resolution of the incident enables the normalization of the bilateral relations between Hong Kong and the Philippines. 
I therefore announce that the sanction against the Philippines is lifted immediately. The 14-day visa-free arrangement applicable to holders of diplomatic or official passports of the Republic of the Philippines for visiting Hong Kong is reinstated. At the same time, since the Philippine government has implemented a range of measures to guarantee tourist safety, I announce that the Black Outbound Travel Alert against the Philippines is lifted with effect from today. Survivors and victims' families have accepted the compensation offer by the Philippines and agreed to move on despite the lack of a proper apology. The Filipino delegation insisted there was no need to use specific words to apologize as long as the intention was there. ATV's author Urquila reports. It's taken three and a half years, but the relatives and victims finally have some closure. Tse Chi Kin, brother of slain tour guide Masa Tse, said he hoped that after all this time he and the other families involved can heal and move on. While he acknowledged that the Philippine government may have stopped short of a direct apology for the bungled hostage rescue operation, the survivors and victims' families were willing to settle for the expression of most sorrowful regret. He revealed that the words sorry and apology were used by the Philippine delegation during their talks. And after three and a half years of anguish, there is no point in dwelling on the details. Lawmaker James Toe has been helping the families, said the wording used by the Philippines was acceptable as an official apology. Manila Mayor Joseph Estrada also insisted that despite the official wording stopping short of an apology, the delegation was sincere and tried to resolve the matter. Yes. It's an apology. However you describe it, our apology was accepted. Estrada insisted the Philippine president should not have to apologize as he was not responsible for what happened in the city or how Manila police handled the crisis. It happened in Manila and the mayor is the one responsible for what happened in his own uh, territory. The mayor the local government has the power and responsibility over the over uh, the policemen and all the employees in the city under the under our local government code. The president has nothing to do with that. Philippine Cabinet Secretary Jose Almendras, who represented the national government in the talks, also addressed criticism of Philippine President Benigno Aquino's refusal to apologize. I know that there have been many impressions about the president's posture in these negotiations. I need to say that the president played a very important role in keeping the Philippine position on an even keel. Amendras insisted that during negotiations between the two governments, the interests of the families were a top consideration. Arthur Urquiola, ATV News. To other news, Health Minister Ko Wing-man has called for calm in the wake of a chickenpox vaccine shortage, saying the government is in touch, is in touch with suppliers to ensure adequate stocks. Ko also played down speculation that Hong Kong may ease its policy banning mainland women from giving birth here. There have been concerns that children may become vulnerable to chickenpox infection as the city faces a vaccine shortage. But before leaving for Beijing this morning, Health Secretary Ko Man said the government is in touch with suppliers to ensure there will be adequate stocks. Ko said he understands parents are anxious about the problem, but he called for calm. He noted that Hong Kong is not alone in facing a shortage. Other countries have also been hit. The health chief said the authorities will kickstart the child vaccination program once there are enough stocks. Ko was also asked about the city's zero delivery quota policy for mainland mothers following reports that women from across the border with Hong Kong spouses may be allowed to give birth here from next year. The policy was introduced last year to ease overcrowding at maternity wards in Hong Kong hospitals. Ko said the hospital authority is reviewing its public services to see whether there's room to accept pregnant mothers married to Hong Kong residents. But he stressed that the government has the responsibility to ensure that local women get priority in public hospitals. 
When pressed about the same issue on his arrival in Beijing, Ko said the government hasn't yet received the assessment report from the hospital authority and warned against jumping to any conclusions. Ko was in the capital for the signing ceremony of a veterinary cooperation agreement between Hong Kong's Food and Health Bureau and the Ministry of Agriculture. The Journalists Association is warning that press freedom in Hong Kong is getting worse after a survey showed confidence in the media taking a hit. The group noted that the survey hadn't even taken into account a recent chopper attack on the veteran journalist. Here's Arthur Urquilla. Hong Kong's first press freedom index was released today, with the Journalists Association expressing concern about the result. The group, with the help of academics and consultants, interviewed 1,000 people and 420 journalists between December and February. The survey found that on a scale of 0 to 100, public confidence in the media stood at 49.4. Uh, I would say that uh, this is a slightly negative measure uh, or negative perception made by the public. <coughs> journalists were even more pessimistic than the public, with confidence in the media registering 42 on their index. I would call a definite negative evaluation of the press freedom situation in Hong Kong. The survey organizers warned that the city's press freedom is at stake. The news media reflects the social situation we live in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is not going up. Uh, Hong Kong is not doing well. Uh, that press freedom is just a reflection of this situation. The chairwoman of the Journalists Association, Sham Yi Lan, said the index could have been even lower had the survey been conducted after a chopper attack on former Ming Pao chief editor Kevin Lau and the dismissal of commercial radio talk show host Li Wei Ling. Sham urged the government to maintain a high degree of transparency to protect the city's status as an information hub. The association said it will conduct similar surveys on a regular basis to monitor press freedom in Hong Kong. Arthur Urquilla, ATV News. Overseas, U.S. President Barack Obama has begun a week-long Asian tour on a controversial note, assuring Japan of his support in a territorial dispute with China. Before arriving in Japan today, Obama promised that Washington will stick to a bilateral defense treaty and oppose any attempt to undermine Tokyo's control over the Daegu Islands. While Obama is not going to Beijing, China's territorial disputes with its neighbors will be high on the agenda when he holds talks with J Japanese, South Korean and Philippine leaders. China is suspicious of his visit at a time when Sino-Japanese relations have hit a new low. Constitutional Affairs Chief Raymond Tam says he's not optimistic that the DAB's political reform proposal can win support in LegCo. His assessment came as the chairman of the Pol government party, Tam Yuchong, dismissed allegations that he had consulted Beijing before unveiling the plan. The city's biggest pro-establishment party last night unveiled its political reform proposal, 10 days before the government ends its five-month public consultation. Constitutional Affairs Minister Raymond Tam said although the DAB left it until yesterday to release its plan, it's better late than never. Uh, we are still um, in the first stage of our public consultation and we would welcome any proposal that may be able to survive three tests, uh, uh, the legal test, political test as well as uh, practical test. The DAB has suggested expanding the nomination committee from 1,200 to 1,600, and chief executive hopefuls must get the support of at least one-tenth of the committee to qualify for an internal ballot. Each committee member will have up to four votes, and the top two to four hopefuls who secure the backing of half of the committee will contest the 2017 polls, in which Hong Kong voters will for the first time choose their top leader. Tam said the DAB's proposal passes the legal and practical tests in that it's feasible and complies with the basic law. But he's not optimistic that the proposal will win the support of pan-democratic legislators, as even some Beijing loyalists see the DAB's nomination threshold as too high. The government needs the support of 47 lawmakers, that's two-thirds of LegCo, to secure approval for whatever political reform proposal it tables. Even if all 43 pro-establishment legislators vote in favor, the administration still has to sway four pan-democrats. DAB Chairman Tam Yu Chung refuted criticisms that the party is trying to block popular candidates critical of Beijing by setting a high threshold. 
譬如你話過半數，喂，喺個提名委員會呢年過。If you can't even win support from half of the nomination committee, that means you're already opposed by many sectors in Hong Kong, Tam insisted. He said the threshold for civil nomination, championed by Pan Democrats, is also very high because it's hard for a person with no political background to secure the backing of one percent of the city's 3.5 million registered voters. The DAB chief also dismissed allegations that he consulted Beijing before unveiling the proposal last night. Raymond Tam was asked today about other political reform proposals, including former Chief Secretary Anson Chan's suggestion to let voters elect part of the nomination committee, and a proposal by 18 scholars to allow the public to recommend chief executive candidates to the committee for approval. Tam stuck to the usual government line, saying he will not comment on specific proposals. But he stressed that no group so far has the confidence that it'll win Lechko's support, and therefore the priority is to reach a consensus and bridge the gap between opposing sides. Investigators in South Korea have raided the home of the owner of the ferry that sank a week ago, killing hundreds of people. Divers have so far pulled out 150 bodies, but 152 people are still missing. ATV's Winner Wang reports. Mourning continues in South Korea for those killed in the country's worst maritime disaster in two decades. Nowhere was the grief deeper than in the industrial town of Ansan near the capital Seoul. The ferry, which sank last Wednesday, was carrying 476 people, including 339 children and teachers from a school in Ansan alone. A memorial altar has been set up to honor those killed when their ferry, the Sewol, sank while on a trip from the port of Incheon near Seoul to the southern holiday resorts of Jeju. With little hope of finding more survivors, the focus is now on recovering bodies trapped in the sunken hull. Divers combing the darkened corridors of the vessel say they have to use their hands to feel for corpses in their path. As a grim hunt continued today, prosecutors raided the home of a man whose company operated the Sewol. Investigators have been checking the firm's finances following the tragedy, amid reports that the owner once served a four-year jail term for fraud. Questions are still being asked how a routine trip ended with a nation mourning. The answers lie with the captain and some crew members who have been arrested for abandoning ship after it began listing. They face a number of charges, including negligence, and have been castigated by President Park Geun-hye, who compared their unacceptable conduct to murder. Many also are demanding to know why the crew ordered passengers to stay put in their cabins, noting that the 174 survivors had ignored the instruction. Officials plan to lift the ferry to the surface using cranes, but they first need the consent of families whose loved ones remain trapped below the sea. Many of the grieving families are living in a makeshift shelter in the nearby port city of Jindo. Their compatriots have responded to the disaster by donating tons of vital supplies, but the outpouring of sympathy and solidarity is little relief to parents whose children lie deep beneath a watery grave. Winnawong, 